Sometimes God wants to work a miracle in you and in me, but sometimes it takes God a lot longer, not because God is sitting back waiting to do something. It's because He's waiting on you and I to do something. Understand the context of this passage of Scripture. Finally, after the Passover of the Israelites putting the blood on the doorposts and the, the spirit of death coming through the Egyptian camp and killing all the firstborn of the Egyptians because that was the curse Pharaoh put on God's children. And seeing the deliverance of God. And now God finally has his way and Pharaoh says, I will let the people go. And now they're getting ready to go. Remembering the promise of milk and honey. God will promise us the promised land in heaven if we're faithful and we follow in his ways. But getting there is another thing. Jesus told us, he says, in this life you will suffer persecution. That much through much tribulation, you will enter into the kingdom. It's nice to go to church and hear a nice message. It's nice to go to church and get motivated. It's nice to go to church and have all those things. But those things will not keep you in the day of trial. What will keep you is when your faith is tested in the fire and you've gone through some things in your life, you can look back and say, God, I remember when I was in distress. I remember when I was persecuted. I remember the things that I went through. And God, you always showed up right on time. The Bible says it this way, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Hallelujah. Not to forget His benefits as far as providing you with materialistic things. But being there for you when emotionally you were drained and tired and weary and going through real times of loneliness and depression and whatever you go through and knowing that God is always faithful and He's always been there for you. And so the Israelites were on their journey. They were being free. Understand this for a moment. 450 years of bondage. 450 years of not being able to worship God the way they wanted to worship God. 450 ways of having to face thousands upon thousands upon idols and false gods. Hearing the talk, seeing the walk of these Egyptians that were following these false gods, yet they were being prosperous and they were being uh, blessed, if you will. Can you imagine the internal feelings of these people who were called to be priests? A holy nation. A royal priesthood. They were called to be a nation to show forth the praises of Him who called them out of darkness into His marvelous light. And yet here they are in bondage and here the enemy is, is prospering and are free and they're in bondage. So finally... They are set free. Can you imagine the jubilation? Can you imagine the people's hearts so happy that now they're being released and now they can go their way. They can do their animal sacrifices. They can, they can obey the commandments of God. They can worship God in truth. And now they're all excited to go. And here they are on their journey. But God doesn't take them the shortest route. See, it would be like going from here to there. A straight journey all the way through. But there was a reason why God didn't want to take them that way. God took them up the hill and down the hill. Around the hill and through the wilderness. What's in the wilderness? Everything in the wilderness is dead. There doesn't seem to be anything that's alive in the wilderness. There's no water. There's no food. There's, there's, why? Because that creates a dependency upon God. 
When you go through these times, these difficult times, when you go through, but see what has happened here is that the people of God were not broken. They were converted to the ideas of Moses. They were converted to the idea of the promised land. They were converted, if you will, to the things that, uh, that they were expecting from God. But they were not broken. You can be serving God and come to church and read your Bible. And you can be in church and you can come to every service. But if you are not broken, hello, you can hear God's word week after week, month after month, year after year, and just continue being in, in the church of God, but yet not be unbroken. Let's look for a moment in Numbers chapter 14. I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. Next verse, please. Their voices rose in great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt! Or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Next verse, please. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Verse 4. Then they plotted among themselves... Let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Can I tell you that's what many Christians are doing today? Rather than going through the trials and tribulations that they face every single day, they're backsliding. They're allowing Satan to come back into their life and say, it is better that we serve Satan than God, and we're going to return to our old way of life. We're going to go back to the old ways of doing things. I'm sick and tired of waiting on God. I'm sick and tired of God waiting upon Him to change this and do this and do that. I'm going back into the world. That's exactly what the children of Israel did. They said, let us appoint a new leader. Of course, it wasn't a new leader. It was the same leader that kept them in the bondage. How easily they forgot when their natural sustenance was dried up. But why did God allow that to happen? Why did God allow them to go through that process? It's because it is so easy to get God's people out of Egypt, but it's so much harder to get Egypt out of God's people. Because of the desires and the wants and, and how we place our values and what we think is all of the world and it's not what God wants. We think that we have to be like the world and we have to do things like the world and we got to have the things of the world when the Bible says we're only passing through. We're pilgrims passing through. It doesn't matter who has the best car or the best house. It doesn't matter who has the best job. Hallelujah. All that matters is are you going through the valley? Are you going through the wilderness holding on to the hand of Almighty God that will sustain you and keep you going through? the process that he has for you. They were unbroken. What are some of the characteristics of an unbroken people? Let's, let's look at a few. Number one, they are only concerned about their own well-being. They are selfish. That's one of the characteristics of an unbroken person. You can be converted. 
You can say you're born again. But until you're broken, you have no life. Jesus said, unless the corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Everything that's planted in the ground dies first. I don't know how Nelson does it, but he can plant things and they just grow. I don't have a green thumb. I don't. I kill things. But some just have a knack of, of, of being a tender planter. And that's what God is. He's a tender planter. But you have to allow him to allow him to allow him to put that growth in you. You have to be willing to be broken. They're only concerned about their well-being. They're selfish. <clears throat> Number two. And this is for you to examine yourself. I'm not here to examine you. I'm not here to judge you or anyone listening to my message. Allow the mirror of God's word to, to judge you. Number two. They will not receive correction without trying to justify themselves. See, the people of Israel coming out of the wilderness, I mean coming out of the Egypt and going into the wilderness began to mumble and complain against the leadership. Why? They blamed him, Moses and Aaron, for leading them into the wilderness. But it wasn't them. I just read to you that God said that God did not lead them along the main road. God brought them into the desert. God brought them into the wilderness. You say, well, pastor, I don't know if God would do that. He did it to Jesus. The Bible says, in, I believe it's in Luke chapter 4, he said that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Are we any better than him? He leads us. He leads us. When we're going through the desert, it's for a purpose. It's not for any reason. Other than that God has something that he wants to take out of you and me. There is something that we're holding on to so dear that we, we've been waiting and waiting for God and waiting for years for God to change, but God ain't going to change it until you release it. Until you're willing to be broken. And only the cross of Jesus Christ can break you. When you see the light of who he is and the light of the power that is in the cross of Jesus. He said to the Jew, it's a stumbling block. To the Greek, it's foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. And a willingness to die to self. That will bring us through the wilderness experience. And accomplish the things that God wants to accomplish in and of your life. There's two ways of doing things. There's our way and then there's God's way. And you can try with frustration, with aggravation, with depression, with all kinds of things going on in your life, and you're trying to make it happen. It will not happen. I can guarantee you that. It's got to be God. But you have to line yourself up to his will. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, that means that you are going to the process of being broken. The pride and the arrogancy of I will not. That pride and arrogancy of I will not must be crucified, must be broken. 
God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. You and I must do that if we want to see real growth in this new 2018 that's coming. Oh, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the same as I was in 2017. But I've got to allow the wilderness experience to fulfill its purpose in my life. Another thing, another characteristic of an unbroken person is they care more about how things look than how things really are. Are you hearing me this morning? They're more concerned on how things look, the perception that they give, rather than how things really are. That's an unbroken person. See, the Israelites were like that. They only looked at the outward. It was better for us to be in Egypt. But they forgot the bondage. The slavery. That they couldn't worship God the way that they wanted to. They couldn't be a free people. They couldn't be a nation. That was supposed to be a holy priesthood. Can I tell you, many Christians today are living like that. They're living in bondage to the enemy because of their unwillingness and their pride and arrogance and will not let go of things that God has put his finger on in their life. You cannot have God and your way. It's either his way or no way. Now understand there's development and there's time to grow, but come on. Yes, there's time to grow, but come on. Some people use that as an excuse to stay the same way that they are. God knows that. God's saying, now is the accepted time. Now is the day, as you see the day approaching of the second coming of Jesus. There's no time to waste. People are waiting for you to share the gospel. People are waiting for you. They won't come on their own. Romans says, how shall they hear unless a preacher is sent? You must be willing to be sent. You must be willing to not be selfish, all consumed with your time, your abilities of what you want to accomplish, and leaving other people out. Amen. Sacrifice. Another characteristic of an unbroken person is they are unwilling to sacrifice unless it's convenient. If I have to go out of my way, I'm not doing it. God, you want me to go over there? Over there? God, you want me to go over there? I can't go over there. I give this testimony not to glorify anyone. But my son, he said a friend of his in the church was working in New Hampshire. And his car broke down. And he needed a ride to work. No one in the church of 125, 150 people would take that man to church. I mean, would take that man to work. But my son said, I will take you. 
And he drove an hour and 45 minutes, right? Huh? One way, 145. Before he went to work in the morning. Brought him to New Hampshire, traveled an hour, 45 minutes back. Worked his full day. Then went back to New Hampshire. Picked him up and did that for how many weeks? Six weeks. How many of us have died to ourselves in that fashion? We can't even call our neighbor. We can't even call the one down the street to come to church. Inconvenience. No wonder they're not here. To me, that's a broken vessel. See? You can have that beautiful perfume bottle with the best fragrance in that bottle. But until you loose that bottle of what's holding the fragrance in, you will never really truly get the fullness of the fragrance. Like the alabaster box. Until it was broken and poured out for Jesus. Until your life is broken, then the fragrance of Jesus will come and be a blessing to others. Fourthly, fourth characteristic of an unbroken person. They are not truthful and they are highly opinionated. They are self righteous. They have a critical, fault finding spirit looking at everyone else's faults with a microscope, but their own with a telescope. They are looking at others' faults with a microscope, but looking at their own with a telescope. Yes, they're converted, but unbroken. And you wonder why the delays, you wonder why it's taking so long for this, and so long for that, and so long for this, and so long for that. It's not because God is not doing it, it's because you're not allowing him to do it. I'm not allowing him to do it. Broken people are compassionate. Proud people, unbroken people are independent, self-sufficient. Broken people have a, dependent on, a dependency on the spirit and recognize their need for others. An unbroken person, I don't need anybody. I don't need anybody. I don't need people in my life. Yes, you do. Because that's how God refines you. Iron sharpening the iron. Do I feel like killing some people sometime? Absolutely. Do I feel like giving them the right foot of fellowship? Yes. That's when you have to die and be broken. Converted. But not unbroken. Proud, unbroken people claim rights and have demanding spirits. 
where broken people yield their rights and have a meek spirit. Let's go back to Exodus. Verse 17, chapter 13. And it came to pass when Pharaoh let the people, let the people go, that God, say God, God, God led them. Why are you complaining about your leaders? They're not leading you, God is. There's what's called a personality cult. People get so caught up in personalities. I remember when I was part of a ministry. I was new Christian. And if the pastor was not at church, certain people didn't go to church. I remember that. Or if there's a service, the attitude is it's only the prayer meeting. It's only Bible study. Unbroken people. Unbroken people are self-conscious. Broken people are not concerned with self at all. God led them not through the way of the Philistines, although that was the closest way. The easiest way. Ask yourself the question. Why is it that I want everything easy? It's not always easy. It's not always easy. You're going to be put in uncomfortable situations. You're going to have people that will not agree with you. You're going to have people talk about you. You're going to have people mock you and laugh at you. So what do you do? Stick your head in the sand and stay home? What happened to being a light unto the world? What happened about being an example to those who are out there that need the example? It just shows unbrokenness. God doesn't lead us in the pathway that makes us most comfortable. Understand that the desert or the wilderness is a place that is not paved roads, smooth roads, and rocky. And can I tell you, when I was in Israel, I saw the valleys and the hills and the wilderness. And the thousands and ten thousands of stones and rocks that are there. It's not easy traveling through those places. Just the mountains and the hills. Are we being broken? Or are we just being converted? Are we just... Are we just Happy to ride the the ride of complacency, knowing that, well, we'll get to heaven. That's all that matters. It's just me and Jesus. It's all that matters is just me and Jesus. Can the hand say, I have no need of the arm? Or the arm, the elbow, or the shoulder, or the torso, 
of the leg or the foot. What if your foot just decided, I don't want to be a part of the body anymore. I want to be alone. You just broke off your leg. How difficult would it be for you to move around? Or if your thumbs just decided one day, I want to just do my own thing. I'm converted, but I want to do my own thing. And I lose my thumbs. How hard and difficult it will be for you to pick up things. To do things that we all take for granted. No, you need your brother. You need your sister because that's how God is refining us. That's how God is getting rid of those things in our life. But if you run from the desert, you will never, never, never be broken. If you run from the hard things, you'll never be broken. You'll just go right on cruising through life, wondering why God has taken his sweet time to do things in your life. And that's not what we want. We don't want that. We want God to move, to have his way in our being. And it's more than just saying it. There has to be action. We have to be willing to be broken. See, when a person was about to be crucified, they took their cross and they walked down the road, knowing their destiny, knowing what was about to take place, knowing that they have already said goodbye to grandma and grandma, grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, sister, brother, and anyone else. They would no longer see them any longer. That this meant the end. They were taking that final walk down what is called death row. Never to see their friends again. They would go to the end of the line and be crucified and would die. Can I tell you that's exactly what a Christian needs to do is make up his mind that he is going to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to live a selfish life anymore. It's not all about me. It's about, Lord, I delight to do thy will, O God. I delight to serve you. I delight to walk after you. I don't care if anyone else is going to go with me. I'm going to go. And the people that God puts in my life, he's put them there for a reason. To shape me and to mold me and to make me into the person that he wants. The reason why the Israelites never made it out of the wilderness. Or let me say it this way. They made it out, but it was only after 40 years. Look at Joshua chapter 5, verse 6. Joshua chapter 5, verse 6. I'm, I'm over here, and I'm, I'm feeling like a tingling on my head, and I'm saying, what is it? It's the fan blowing over. It's blowing my little hairs. And I'm like, I feel like a tingling on my head. I don't think that's the anointing. So that's when I moved over here, went away, and I said, okay, now I know what it is. You have that scripture for me, brother, Joshua? The Israelites had traveled in the wilderness for 40 years. Until what? All the men who were old enough to fight in battle when they had left Egypt had died. And I tell you, you will continue wandering in the wilderness until you put that old man to death. Until you finally decide that it's no longer you that's going to live, but Christ's going to live in you. You'll go in that desert and you wander around in that desert, hungry and thirsty, unfulfilled, 
walking around in that desert, walking around in the desert. But you know what happened? The reason why it took them 40 years, because all they did was moan and groan and complain. Oh, uh, how come this person's got this and I ain't got that? How come, God, you did that for that person, but you didn't do it for me? How come I've been waiting for all so long, God, you ain't done nothing for me? Because they're moaning and groaning and complaining. They're complaining about church. They're complaining about this. They're complaining about that. Why isn't anything happening for me? Why isn't God answering my prayer? Come on, somebody. They're wandering in the wilderness. They had to wait for that generation of complainers and moaners and groaners to die. You don't have to wait 40 years to take the position that God has already ordained for you to take. And that's to place yourself once and for all holy of your free will to that cross. And say, Lord, I'm going to live for you. No longer will I live for myself. No longer will I make the decisions for myself. God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm not putting any limits on you, God. I believe sometimes when we put limits on God, God is limited with us. But yet we want God to do everything for us. And we won't do anything for God. Oh, we'll serve him this much. We'll serve him this much. We'll serve him this much. It's raining out. I can't go to church today because it's raining. I can't go to church today because the sun's not shining today. I can't go to church today because, you know, uh, my, my friends are over. I have company. What happened to bring them to church? Oh, but you can't let them know you're a Christian and you... Because, you know, after all, they'll make fun of you. That's why I commend my friend Joe. When he had friends stay over for the weekend unexpectedly, Sunday morning he made them coffee, had some croissants for them, put it out there and said, hey, enjoy yourself, I'm going to church. And they're like, whoa, 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 how come you ain't staying here with us? He said, no, it's not that I have to go to church. I want to go to church. Amen. And I admired that. I said, that's a good characteristic. Do we want to be here? Or do we have to be here? You should want to be here every time the door is open. That's how it was in the early days. Couldn't wait to get to church. And after church, sometimes we spent more hours outside of church at Dunkin' Donuts or this place or that place, eating and talking about the Lord and the things of the God. We would spend six, eight hours there and two or three hours in the service. Sometimes we didn't get home till four o'clock in the morning. Whatever happened to those times where we put God first? And everything else, second. You know, it amazes me that people will not be late for work, but they'll be late for church. Won't be late for work if they have to punch a card, have to be there on time. Everything gets done, and they get to, they get to work. On time. And I notice this big among Brazilians. Always late. Nigerians, always late. My friend has a Nigerian church. I told him, I said, you need to change the, the, the title of your church. Church of the Late Beginnings. 
I did. I told them that. I said, you need to change the name to the Church of the Late Beginnings. Everyone came in late after worship. Some of them 45 minutes to an hour after service. I mean, before the, the preaching. Why? They would never do that for their job. So where is their heart? Where's their heart? Well, you know, at least I'm in church. You think God wants your least? Think God is satisfied with your least? No, God wants your best. He wants my best. He wants our best. Until all the old enough to fight in battle when they left Egypt had died, for they had disobeyed the Lord, and the Lord vowed he would not let them enter the land he swore to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Can I tell you, listen to me right now, unless you are willing to allow that old man to be dead, you will never walk in the fullness of the, of the flowing of milk and honey or the promises of God that he has for your life. You know, people think it's glamorous when you travel. You know, oh, you're a missionary and you go to India and you go to Africa and you go to China and you go to all these places. They think it's, they think it's, a, it's, it's a glorious thing. Try sitting in an airplane on, to China with your knees almost up near your chin for 20 hours. 20 hours. Try not being able to sleep because of the 9, 10, 12, 14 hour difference. When you're going to bed, they're up. When they're up, you're going to bed. Your body clock doesn't change that easily. So why do we go? Why do we do the things we do? Because our life is not our own. And until you get to that point, don't expect the milk and honey to be flowing. So for 2018, what is your goal? What is your desire? What is, what is it that you want God to do in your life? And set that goal and then say, okay, God, what do I have to do? to see this flow to me? What do I need to do to make this thing happen? How do I make it happen? You know how you make it happen? By being obedient to his voice. Some of us, God has told us, you need to be here Monday night. Not here. You need to be here Wednesday night? Not here. Come on. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some real legitimate excuses why people can't come. Understand that. But if you don't have a reason, a good one, oh, pastor, I, I couldn't go. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't go Sunday morning to church, you know. I banged my toe into the closet, and I, I can't go to church today. Okay, Pastor? Okay. We'll pray for you. Half hour later, ding, ding. Hello? Yes. We're going to Six Flags. Would you like to come? Okay, yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> Come on. It's the truth. Oh, we're going to go do this or go do that. Oh, okay, I'll be there. But church? Hi, baby. Converted. 
but unbroken. And I was talking with my son. And I said, you know, that's almost impossible. Because if you're really converted, if you're really converted, I mean really converted, there's a change. You've gone from one kingdom to another. And that desire should be there. That I want to, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to be where God wants me to be. But have you noticed the decline of that in the churches? Now they're doing away with Bible studies. They're doing away with prayer services. They're doing away with altar services. You and I couldn't go into a church at one time. Just walking through the doors without seeing somebody at the altar. There was always somebody at the altar. There was always somebody praying. Someone interceding. Someone that had a need. And I believe this with all of my heart. If we had more people seeking God to meet their needs and seeking God for their psychological welfare, we wouldn't need psychiatrists anymore. We wouldn't need to be counseled anymore. God will counsel you right here. But then we got sophisticated. We have Christian psychologists and Christian counselors. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes we need that because some people are so far gone that they need that to get them to the point to depend on God. And then the counselor steps aside and says, okay, now it's you and God. I've done all I can do. Now it's you and God. You can counsel for hours and hours and hours and get the same result. I don't do that. I counsel for now. If they don't take the counsel that I've given them in that hour, guess what? I don't counsel them anymore. It's a waste of my time. If you're not going to do what I'm telling you to do, it's the truth. If he comes to me, says, Daddy, I have this problem. And I say to him, okay, do this, this, and this, and that problem will be taken care of. But he goes and does three things, the opposite of what I told him. And yet comes back to me again and says, Daddy, I have a problem. He tells me the same thing. I said, did you do this, this, and this? No, I did this, this, and this. Don't waste my time. Because you're not listening. You came to me. I didn't come to you. <laughs> Yeah. You ever talk to somebody and they, and they already know what you're going to say before you even say it? And what they were going to say was not right. Converted. Hear me now. Converted, but unbroken. Now, here's the, here's the real test. Am I speaking to you? I'm going to ask Bob to put something on, please. Yeah. Am I speaking to you this morning? Are you converted? But unbroken. You cannot be a Christian and beat your wife. You cannot be converted and go to prostitutes. You cannot be converted. And be a drunkard. You cannot be converted and be a drug addict. You cannot be converted and constantly being in nightclubs. 
And in that atmosphere, in partying with everybody Monday through Saturday, then be a Christian on Sunday. Are you converted? But unbroken. I'm going to ask you to come up. Let me pray for you. Now here's part of being unbroken pride. What will they say? What will somebody say if I go up there? If I go up there, people are going to know there's something in my life. Well, guess what? God already knows. Are you unbroken? I'll just give you a few minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you for honest people. Thank you for honest people. Thank you, Lord, for honest people. That's it. You didn't come here to see me. You came here to see God. Your pride and arrogance will not allow you to enter the promised land of milk and honey as you refuse to be broken. You're converted and you're satisfied with that. But you won't make it to the promised land. You look at that picture that's up on the screen. It's a church that is wasted. There's a man praying. And I tell you, that's much of the church today is wasted. People refuse to be changed, to be broken. Remember, the children of Israel were just converted, meaning brought over to another belief view. But to be broken. The Bible says a broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. He will not despise that. Because that is being honest and truthful with him. And just just begin to pray right now. Don't look to me. I can't supply anything for you. Just ask God, say, God, break whatever in my life needs to be broken. And but get ready because he's going to do it. He's going to put his finger on some areas and you're not going to like it. You're going to you're going you're gonna to feel a little uncomfortable. God's going to say, that's okay. I'm right here with you. I'm, I'm going to walk you through this. One thing about the wilderness experience, God was right there. Built a tabernacle. Right there. Led them with a pillar of fire by day and a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He was there in that time getting them to the point of willingness to be broken. Because now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. Just cry out to Him right now. Now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. 